a time when your clothing and accessories can harness the power of the sun. Even with all the challenges we need to consider, could that bright new technology be right around the corner? Most of us think solar panels are something that sit on a roof, but many materials go into making a solar cell. Getting them extracted and transported to the places they can be used is no small feat. Copper and tin, for example, start with laborious mining and production processes, and trade has always been a critical aspect of their success. Not to mention indium, silicon, oil, silver, and aluminum. In fact, most of the materials we need to create new technologies, such as solar panels, have a similar story. Where are we going to get the materials to make all of these new products? And what lessons can we learn from the past? In the ancient world, um, bronze was not produced in the same area in which copper was smelted. You have copper smelters in one place that would, not even they would be in the area where copper was mined from. So you have miners transporting the copper for the smelting sites and the smelters will actually send the smelted copper to the bronze making sites, all three being connected by trade. Similarly, in the, modern, in the modern world, you don't have the production of PVs in the same place where polysilicon is necessarily made. And you don't have the, 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 the PVs made in the same place where they are used. Um, although there are cases like that, for example, in China nowadays, um, they, they tend to be rather the exception than the rule. The photovoltaic effect, or PV, is a conversion from light into electrical energy. It was first observed by the French scientist Edmond Becquerel, but the first PV cells didn't come along until more than 100 years later. You can use the sun to create electrical energy without pollution and pretty efficiently. The sun shines someplace on Earth 24 hours a day. In fact, the sun delivers more energy to the Earth in one hour than the world uses in a year. It seems like a no-brainer. If solar energy is so abundant and clean, why aren't we all using it? What's the catch? The issue is really the economics. The big portion of the cost is the manufacturing cost and the installation. When we can reduce these costs to a level so that the solar electricity can compare with the grid electricity at the same cost, then we are going to see a much bigger use of solar cells. There also needs to be better storage methods, like batteries, for when the sun isn't shining. And lastly, some of the materials are toxic, so we also have to worry about the environmental impact. Silicon is the traditional photovoltaic material, and it's a very hard and brittle material. However, we discovered that we can actually use aromatic compounds, which are organic photovoltaics, and these photovoltaics enable us to make flexible materials. It means that you could actually integrate a solar cell into your backpack or something else that's wearable, and this means that they will become seamlessly integrated into our environment. In, in our laboratory, we study organic materials. Many of them are actually semiconducting. Just, just like a silicon, they can be semiconductors. They can absorb sunlight and then generate electricity. One of the fundamental uh, interests for us is to produce flexible panels. They can be fabricated onto plastics or metal foils. The cost of producing these materials are a lot lower than producing the silicon crystals. The flexible panels can have other usages as well. Uh, for example, we can put it on the outside of the building. Organics can have very different kind of colors, so we can make camouflage or whatever color you want to use. The other usage is think about all these grass that we have. You have to water the grass and you have to put it on fertilizers, and you have to cut the grass often. So, so think about generating these uh, green uh, organic-based solar cells and putting them on plastic films and you can cut them into grass shape and now you have an organic-based uh, solar turf instead of a real turf. So this will generate a lot of electricity without having the need to take care of the grass. So the first step is just to clean them and we use solvent, uh, acetone, isopropanol to clean them and oftentimes we use ultrasonic uh, sonicator uh, to help us clean and just to get rid of all the grease and dust particles on the surface so we can have a very clean uh, surface to start making the device. All right, so after we clean the sample, we come to this vacuum chamber to deposit some of the materials. And we're just gonna put the sample face down. 
into these pockets and then load it into the vacuum chamber. And once you load it, you can close it. And then start pumping. We have to pump down the chamber to the vacuum. Uh, and it generally, it takes anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour and a half. So I just showed you the vacuum process uh, for depositing some of the organic materials. An alternative process is solution process, uh, which is typically done in these nitrogen-filled glove boxes. So this is a spin coater. Um, we have the sample here. So we just load the sample onto the holder. Extract the liquid. All right, we close the lid and then let it spin. So this is the sample that we obtain afterwards. So the last step is really to encapsulate the devices. And what we do is just put a small cavity on top. We have a small piece of glass, the round one that you can see up on top. Use some epoxy to seal on the edges. So now create a small uh, cavity inside that is free of oxygen or moisture. And what you see up on top, you see the organics, the colored piece in the middle, and then you see the shiny part that is the metal electrode we deposit on top. Because as I mentioned, in the solar cells, you need to have two electrodes. We have the transparent electrode down at the bottom, uh, right on the surface of the glass. And then after we're putting down the organic layers, we complete the device with that metal electrode. So what you see is actually a, a, a few small solar cells on a one inch by one inch glass substrate. Now these devices are small obviously, uh, but they are sufficient in the laboratory for us to study the basic properties of these materials and also how they function in a device setting. Now in real world obviously, uh, you, that's not sufficient. So you can, you, these are the plastic sheets that people have made using the printing technologies. Um, and these are made on plastic film, so they are very flexible and they are translucent. Uh, so if you think about a very large piece of this, possibly you can put it on a rooftop or maybe on the side of the building or maybe uh, in a solar farm or maybe use them, slice them into grass blade shape or tree leaf shape and assemble them into, uh, into turfs or artificial trees. Or you can slap those, those things on fabrics. So now you can think about so you have a solar cell on your backpack, which you can use to charge your iPods, iPads, or whatever uh, while you are under the sun. The solution with the, with the aromatic compounds is one that has to do with the manufacture of the PVs rather than with the extraction of the solar energy itself. I'm thinking that perhaps the solution in the future will be a combination of the two technologies that will actually lead to some breakthrough into uh, this. Instead of the big panels on your, on your house, you're gonna just have a little strip here that will, retain, will be flexible in terms of the shape, but will be able to, re to retain an enormous amount of solar energy. The energy supply is an issue that we have to solve, okay? Is this generation next generation because the fossil fuels is not renewable? At some point, we're gonna use up all those uh, coal and uh, natural gas and oil. So at some point, we have to rely on this renewable energy. But this is a very complex problem. It's not, it cannot be solved by one single discipline. So we work on material science engineering, but we also need to work with chemists physicists, electric engineers, and chemical engineers and mechanical engineers to solve the problem together. Uh, so it's a very complex issue, involves many different disciplines, and people need to have that kind of mindset. Uh, it's, you have to work on your side, but you have to work as part of a team to solve the problem together. The ability to create potentially wearable photovoltaics opens a tremendous opportunity for these materials in the future. However, of course, as scientists, we have to figure out not only how to make them more efficient, but also more cost affordable and degradation resistant. So what does this mean to the future of affordable, sustainable energy? If it were within your power, how would you manage the opportunities that photovoltaics present to society?